program and i now request dr rakesh kumar director neeri to say a few words uh, so welcome again uh, dr atya has already welcomed all of you uh, it's really a great pleasure for all of us that luminaries uh, of uh, the different subjects have come in and i would uh, like to speak few th- few sentences in hindi as well aaj ka din isliye bhi shubh hai और इसलिए भी अच्छा है क्योंकि हम लोग वर्ल्ड इन्वायरमेंट डे एज अ डे सेलिब्रेट करते हैं और हमारा जो इंस्टीट्यूट है नेशनल इन्वायरमेंटल इंजीनियरिंग रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट इस 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 इंस्टीट्यूशन में हम लोग ऑलमोस्ट डेली बेसिस पे कुछ ना कुछ इन्वायरमेंट के लिए करते हैं तो इट इज़ इम्पॉर्टेंट टू एक्नोलेज ऑल द पीपल हु वर्क विद अस नॉट ओनली विद इन द इंस्टीट्यूट बट ऑल्सो आउटसाइड एंड फॉर ऑल द ऑडियंस हुए Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to share that uh, that kind of platform that uh, institution which works with government uh, gets paid th- through the government but we have been uh, rated as one of those people who who are very 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 neutral in in terms of view of what the environment should be uh, as of now if you see uh, currently uh, i would want to share that more than 1000 acres of land which was a waste land uh, in and around uh, vidarbha region Uh, we have now transformed them into a nice bamboo forest uh, we have again few thousand acres of land in mining areas which were waste land again uh, they have been rejuvenated over a period of 15 20 years uh, you know by way of u- using uh, eco rejuvenation technologies we have been greening uh, some of the highways by way of knowing how different kind of plants which can be grown in difficult situation that's the kind of uh, you know expertise we have Neri, of course, works in traditional areas of air pollution, water, waste water, and our latest stuff and climate uh, science and technology. But in terms of directly working in biodiversity, uh, we have a team of people who are very dedicated and they keep striving to work in this area. Uh, some of the recent work which we also did in water system, like more than 150 lakes are getting rejuvenated using our own technology. In Bangalore, we are doing. Uh, Whole master planning for 220 lakes plus. And uh, interesting thing is that when we talk about these water bodies, we, when we talk about these forests, when we talk about all of these, they seem to be a smaller system when when the local people talk about. But the moment you take a satellite picture from uh, from space, uh, you see they are actually connected. Uh, they are part of one single system. And that's where it is important that on a day like this. and on a day like this when we have multiple experts sitting together uh, we bring in the strength of intellectualism also uh, while nature shows us in interconnectedness is very important that we also show our way of uh, combining our knowledge and then taking it forward in the field just to uh, two more points that i thought i should share with all of you that is, is, is uh, the millennium biodiversity assessment when it was done Uh, that was almost a decade back it worked out the economic cost of uh, loss of biodiversity and some of those losses were more than the gdp of many countries so this is the time to acknowledge that part that is not fashionable enough to say we are saving a tree we are saving a tiger or we are saving a mangrove forest it is it is an absolute cost much higher in gdp which is actually going to cause much more damage to us so welcome all of you and i look forward to a very interesting keynote address by professor sinha uh, we have uh, in panel uh, jan sastrabuddhi ji uh, dr deepa kapte we know for a long time uh, dr jakati and 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 all professor bakre who are uh, who is a person uh, very knowledgeable in this field uh, i am so glad to see all of you here so thank you for joining and all the audience they are going to have a feast today in terms of knowledge and a discussion thank you thank you sir um before i ask dr sinha to make his uh, presentation i would like to introduce you all to him professor anindya sinha is based at the national institute of advanced studies in bangalore and he is the adjunct faculty at six other institutions in india and the uk he had earlier studied botany with a specialization in cytogenetics at the calcutta university in kolkata 
and earned a doctorate in molecular biology in 1993 from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Having worked on biochemical genetics and molecular biology of carbohydrate metabolism in Baker's yeast. His early research concerned the behavior of biology of wasps, social cognition in macaques, classical genetics of human disease, and the philosophy of human non human species relationships, which he studied at the Center of Ecological Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science and National Center for Biological Sciences, both in Bangalore. His current research interests, which he has been involved in over more than three decades now, are primarily in the area of animal behavior, ecology, cognitive ethology, evolutionary biology, population and behavioral genetics, urban animal studies, particularly of primates and other mammalian species, philosophy of biology, performance studies, and an intangible as well as the tangible cultural heritage of India. You can easily understand now why he is this keynote speaker of our program. He's also deeply interested in the popularization of biology and in addition to establishing a master's degree program in wildlife biology and conservation in Bangalore, this was done in 2001, he works closely with the International Biology Olympiad for almost two decades. He has lectured extensively in a variety of education and research institutes, both across and outside the country. And uh, I'm sure that this has really raised all your curiosity in listening to him. So Dr. Sina, please may I ask you to take the podium. So you are on mute. Dr. Sina, you're still on mute. Sorry. I'm sorry. I still need to get used to this. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaple, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Niri, for inviting me. This is indeed a great honor for me to be here uh, with you. Um, and I look forward to discussions with, with this eminent other speakers who are there today, many of whose work I have admired for a long period of time. Uh, so may I just uh, quickly share the screen first uh, and then begin my talk. So I wanted to speak today very briefly about some of the challenges to biodiversity conservation in Northeastern India. Um, uh, so uh, the, we are all familiar with global biodiversity hotspots. At a recent count, there are 36 such biodiversity hotspots across the world, which are not only reservoirs for a huge variety of species, both flora, fauna, microorganisms, but also tragically, many of these 36 uh, hotspots are today threatened with destruction. And of course, as Dr. Uh, Kapli pointed out in her introduction, much of this is because of one species, humans, uh, because of our sort of expansion of activities which seems to be threatening habitats and species across the world. Now, if we come to India and look at uh, the hotspots, we have four uh, hotspots, uh, the biodiversity hotspots in our country. Uh, in the north, we have the Himalaya, of course, and the Indo-Burma region. And in the southwest, the Western Ghats, and deep south, we have the Sunderland uh, biodiversity hotspot, which includes the Nicobar Islands. In the northeast, which I wanted to focus on a bit today, we of course have the montane uh, biodiversity hotspot of the Himalayas, but south of that, we have the Indo-Burma region. And clearly, the fact that we have two biodiversity hotspots in such close juxtaposition tells you what a fascinating area this is in terms of distribution of species and their endemism, their uniqueness, and a variety of factors, which I will come to. Now, before I uh, go further, I wanted to briefly talk about some of our work and this was in the eastern Himalaya, which is again, as I said, a biodiversity hotspot. Now, this region particularly is fascinating because it is at the junction of what was earlier three um, um, biogeographical realms. Uh, the Palearctic, which has now been split into the Palearctic and the 
uh, Sino-Japanese, which is towards the south, and the Indian and the Indo-Malayan, which together now call, is called the Oriental uh, Biogeographic Realm. And the fact that the northeastern part of our country and the eastern Himalaya is at the junction of these biogeographical realms makes it a fascinating hotpot of species which not only have evolved in isolation, but which have then subsequently come into contact with species from the other regions. And this has led to the hybridization and the generation of a very large diversity of living forms. Now, Arunachal Pradesh uh, is particularly fascinating because it has extensive forest cover, very low human densities, and has remained always rather poorly explored. And it is here that uh, in this region of Tawang district, which is the westernmost district of Arunachal Pradesh in a region called Zemithang, that in 1995, we reported a species, the Arunachal Makak, uh, which was then new to science. <clears throat> Before I talk a bit about the species, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because even now we are perhaps discovering species, plants, animals that are new to science, that are new to our country. And I think that just tells you that it's such an immensely rich area that tragically may disappear even before we have come to know it very well. Now, one point I want to make here is that this species was just new in terms of our report, right? Traditional knowledge had always known the species. And I think my first message would be that we have ignored traditional knowledge uh, at our own peril. I think it's extremely important to consider uh, how what local communities know about the biodiversity of their region. We need to incorporate them, their knowledge system, and most importantly, many of their practices, perhaps, though we think may be threats to biodiversity, they also have within them um, elements that perhaps we could learn from and use in terms of our biodiversity conservation. Now, the Arunachal macaque is largely distributed in Tawang and West Kaming district. And with the possibility that it may occur in the central Arunachal Pradesh, in Bhutan, or even in Tibet, but there have been no studies there. Now, uh, the, uh, this species, the Arunachal macaque, was called the Makaka Munzala. And the reason I'm showing this slide is for two reasons. The first is we name the species uh, Makaka Munzala from the traditional knowledge of the Monpa people who live in this region. And in fact, in the language Dirang Monpa, the Munzala is how this species is referred to, which means deep forest monkey. And we paid tribute to their traditional knowledge by naming the species after them. We didn't also want to sacrifice any individual because we thought they were threatened and it was ethically not correct for us. We felt to sacrifice an animal. And so a point I want to make here is that it is possible also to report a new species on the basis of good quality photographs and hence the holotype, which is the individual shown above, and the other three paratypes were ba described entirely based on photographs. And I think this is one of the ways in which perhaps one can contribute to the to maintaining the biodiversity of new regions. Now, this was in, 19, uh, in 2005. Ten years later, 2015, the white-cheeked macaque is the latest entrant into primates, into non-human primates. This species was discovered in southeastern Tibet. And in the same year, it was by a wonderful discovery, it was found in the Anjor district of Arunachal Pradesh, it's the northeasternmost corner of our country, and the white-cheeked macaque has now been a new species of monkey, which was has been added to our list of fauna. I'm sure many of you know about the Bugunla cicla, which is a new species of bird, which was discovered and, uh, in northeastern India, again in the West Kaming district of Arunachal Pradesh, and of course, moving away from the enigmatic species, which are typically the large mammals and birds, there are also a whole range of other kinds of living forms, which are endemic to the north northeast of our country. Now, this is uh, Gymnophiona, which is a tropical Sicilian amphibian. It's a, a very independent family of living amphibians, limbless, uh, soil dwelling. And what was fascinating is with this discovery of this Sicilian in the northeast, what we realized very importantly is that the northeast is not simply a kind of a passageway between two different global biodiversity hotspots, but itself forms an extremely unique 
biographically rich region with its own ancient endemic flora and fauna. And therefore, this tells you that perhaps every area within the Northeast needs to be explored much further to understand uh, what we have there. Now, this is, as I said, a region of high endemism. The pygmy hog is a wonderful example again, where I'm sure you know that there are less than 150 individuals left in the wild. And there has been a very rich program of captive breeding and reintroduction led by um, Dr. Gautam Narayan, which is trying to bring back populations of the species. But what is most fascinating is that this is also endemic to this pygmy hog sucking louse which is a species perhaps we would have never discovered had we not been interested in the pygmy hog. And with typically less than 150 hosts left in this while, this arthropod is also under threat, right? And of course, we have the greater adjuted stalk with less than 1,200 individuals left in the wild. And turning to plants, I'm sure many of you know about the insectivorous plants and the pitcher plant Nepenthes cassiana, which is found only in Meghalaya, is one of those wonderful textbook examples of insectivorous plants, but which today is extremely threatened. And therefore, the point again I want to make here is that in addition to the so-called enigmatic species, such as elephants and the rhinoceroses, which of course deserve our attention, we also need to look at the arthropods, the amphibians, the reptiles, the fish, the plants, microorganisms in the soil, in the water, many of which contribute to the biodiversity, but which we seem to tend to neglect. So the reason why the Northeast, as I said, has this extraordinary biodiversity is because, as I again said, that it's at the confluence of the Sino-Japanese and the Oriental biogeographical realms. And what are biogeographical realms? Basically, these are very large spatial domains encompassing terrestrial and aquatic habitats, but within which most of the ecosystems that you find within one realm seem to have share certain aspects of biological evolution processes, which is why they together constitute one biogeographical realm. Now, what are the most important threats that uh, we should consider that we think may be important? Hunting. Uh, hunting, of course, as you know, is typically carried out over large bodied species. They lead to empty forests, a syndrome that is very well known in the Northeast. However, I must also say that looking at it from the other perspective, hunting has also been a part of the traditional lifestyle of many communities. And therefore, while it's easy for us to say that it leads to loss of biodiversity, which indeed it may be, especially in today's world, where much of these practices may not be sustainable anymore, we don't even know which species are perhaps being hunted, we must also tread with a bit of caution because ultimately at some level, and I will bring poaching into this as well. Poaching is a term which is heavily negative with negative connotations, but let's not forget that poaching also in some cases is a part of perhaps the only life history strategy, the only way to earn for many of the impoverished communities. And so to return to what I was saying is one point we must remember is that if we have to protect the biodiversity of a particular region, let's say the Northeast, we also need to think of the welfare of the people, of the people themselves. What kind of livelihoods do they have? What are their ways of surviving, right? The recent example of the elephant, the pregnant elephant, which died in Kerala uh, because of an explosive that it tried to feed on is a very, very poignant case in point. It was not a purposeful killing. It was an accident because the farmers put up these explosives to keep out chital or wild pigs. And in the process, we have lost elephants as well. Now, although we can always blame people for being cruel, for using these practices, we also need to understand that the survival of these biodiversity in these regions depends on the welfare and well-being of the local communities as well. They may have had traditional practices which are very close to that of the wildlife. We need to find ways in which perhaps we can wean them away from this dependence on natural habitats and the biodiversity and provide them with an equal viable life history options so that we can protect the other non-human species as well. This is really why human-animal conflict is becoming such an important uh, aspect of our lives across the country, but specifically so in Northeast. And of course, there are other practices, again, linked very closely to the lifestyle of people, for example, shifting cultivation, much of 
a lot has been written on this. And this was, of course, a traditional non-settled form of agriculture for many of the hillside, the uh, montane communities. And people have debated at great length that this might be the only option they have to bring up their crops. On the other hand, that does lead to loss of soil, loss of water resources, uh, devastation in terms of natural flora and fauna. But on the other hand, there may also be processes which we can then introduce, including keeping land fallow, allowing plants and animals to return, which might be ways in which we can perhaps try and maintain some kind of balance between a practice that is impossible for us to ban and perhaps unethical for us to ban versus maintaining uh, the um, biodiversity of the region. Now, I want to also very briefly touch upon the issue of big, uh, big dams. Many of you are aware of the Italian project in the Dibang Valley, which has raised a huge amount of controversy. And of course, I don't have time to go into it, but I just wanted to highlight some of the important aspects uh, of that uh, of our lives of our lives that threaten the biodiversity of the region oil palm plantations and traditionally tea coffee spice plantations which have uh, filled up much of these areas were considered important economically but have led to a tremendous amount of loss of the traditional uh, biodiversity. There is a question, of course, of linear infrastructure, roads, railway lines, power lines, which take their toll, but we consider it an essential part of our uh, civilization, right? The way we live. And therefore, somewhere we need to strike a balance between how we live and how other species could be allowed to live without our interference. Similarly, is the case of uh, mining, which we again have heard of, or there may be other kinds of threats, invasive species, climate change in the long term, even human factors such as insurgency, in many cases in, of which in Northeast, we have, led, we have really lost a large number of species. Uh, right. Now, moving on, what are the main kind of problems that we face. The most important problem that we face is what is called habitat loss. Because of all the activities that I just described to you, we are losing our habitats. And the other problem that we face is that of fragmentation. Now, tropical forests is a wonderful example. In fact, we have the last lowland tropical forests of the country in the Brahmaputra Valley of uh, Assam. And these forests support almost 50% of all the life forms that we know in that region. But here, just to cite an example from the Amazon, you can see how tropical deforestation is leading to extensive losses of biodiversity. And I think this is true for our country and the Northeast as well. An extremely important point here is that of fragmentation. As with time, human activities increase, we find that large habitat expanses are transformed into a number of small patches, which are isolated from each other in a matrix of heterogeneous habitats. And as you can imagine, within these fragments, lives are lost, right? And habitat fragmentation, along with habitat loss, is a very major challenge uh, to our future that we need to understand. Now, very quickly, in a couple of minutes, I will talk about, again, a bit of our work in the Upper Brahmaputra Valley, especially with the primates. Now, the primate communities in the Upper Brahmaputra Valley in some of these fragments, and we surveyed about 45 fragments in this region over a period of 10 years, is one of the richest non-human primate biodiverse regions anywhere in the world. In fact, if you look at the primate biomasses in some of these fragments, uh, the density and the richness and the biomass perhaps competes with that of Brazil or the Amazonia or even that of tropical rainforests in Central Africa. Right. And the main question we asked uh, very briefly is how do local and landscape factors affect primate species richness, abundance and distribution? And to summarize the results very quickly, we found an average species richness of 3.2. Uh, in each of these fragments, and we surveyed 45 fragments, some of them as small as being five or six square kilometers. Uh, we also found on an average, there were six species in a large fragment, 3.37 species in a medium fragment, about 2.17 species in a small fragment. 50% of the fragments have more than three primate species, the other 50% have less than two primate species, but very rarely do you find a fragment which does not have a remnant primate population. On an average, we find that one species has been lost in the last 30 years, and seven fragments have already been cleaned uh, 
completely. They don't exist anymore. And in, on an average, each fragment has lost one third of its original habitats. So therefore, to conclude, is the future of biodiversity so bleak in Northeast India? Yes, our activities are leading to widespread losses, habitat loss, fragmentation, loss of species through a variety of activities that I talked about. But I think there is still hope. Uh, if you, we find that protection does work. A wonderful example is that of the rhinoceros in Kaziranga and some other smaller uh, sanctuaries where sheer protection from poaching and from re rescuing them during floods has been a great success story. Community participation is, I think, something that we have neglected in the past, in, especially in the colonial times, but we now need to look at. The Ghora Abe Society is a wonderful example in Pakke uh, uh, Tiger Reserve. These, this is a community of hunters, of poachers, who have now become conservationists. And I think they have done wonderfully for the species in uh, Pakke, uh, in their conservation, in spreading the news of uh, the flora and fauna amongst local communities, contributing to successful programs such as the Hornbill Nest Adoption program of NCF or to return back to the pygmy hog reintroduction program. Uh, I think many of you may have uh, known the work of Dr. Gautam Narayan, who's been able to not only successfully breed the pygmy hog in his center in Gohati, but has now successfully reintroduced them into two wildlife sanctuaries. And we hope with time their numbers will increase. So let me end this talk with a poem because I think sometimes much of what we talk about in science is so wonderfully complemented by the creativity of poets, of artists. And here is the poem, and it says, when the monkey on the bough of the jackfruit tree in the town's commons mistakes for fruit the eye on the thronged drumheads hung up there by mendicant bards, he taps on it, and the sound rouses the male swans below to answering song. Now, that's a beautiful poem. It's very evocative because there are two non-human species, the monkeys and the swans interacting, of course, mediated by the drums where the human is present as well. But what is most fascinating is that this is a poem. The poet is someone called Mutta Mochiar. This is from the Sangam, Tamil Sangam period. And this particular poem translated by A.K. Ramanujan is at least 2000 years old. So 2000 years ago, there was a monkey in the jackfruit tree in the town's commons. And the point I want to make here to finish my address is that humans and non-human species have lived together for centuries, for 2000 years. Humans form a part of the natural ecology of many of these species today, and yet we know so little about them. Yet we do so little to try and conserve them. We do so little to make sure that our lives don't interfere with that. And what can we do? What can each of us do? Perhaps think a bit more deeply about how our actions impact many of these species. Are there ways simply in our homes, in our schools, in our colleges, in our institutions where we work? Are there small practices that we can bring in which will make less demands on the environment? And believe me, that ultimately will affect the primates of Northeast India. It will affect the tribal communities across our country. And I think even switching off a light bulb or a fan when we are not using it contributes in its own way to protecting our biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sina. I really wish that we didn't have a time limit to this talk. It was so fascinating. And I really hope that maybe we can persuade you to come one more time where we don't keep a time limit. So I'm sure you all wonderful enjoyed audience. it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We really thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, now we will move on to the panel discussion. We have four panelists, but Dr. Sina will also be joining in along with Dr. Rakesh Kumar. Uh, the viewers on the Facebook can also post their questions uh, there and uh, I will put them up to the panelists uh, if we have time. And in case I am not able to answer or address all the questions, uh, then I, I apologize in advance. But our topic for today is uh, urban biodiversity and biodiversity preservation for integrating society. 
and uh, i uh, what we are going to do is that i would just um, introduce uh, the panelists one by one uh, we would post uh, one question to the panelists and uh, they would answer that and uh, uh, given more of their inputs and their uh, talk and then we go to the next and uh, like this we go through all the four panelists and then in the end we take up whatever questions that may arise in the program if we still have time so our first panelist is uh, dr deepak apte and uh, he holds a doctorate in zoology with specialization in marine ecology he did his post graduate degrees in the field of zoology from the university of mumbai integrated coastal zone management from ait bangkok and marine policy from the duke university usa he is currently the director of the bombay natural history society and is a recipient of the prestigious green or witley award and the witley continuation award for his work on the giant clams in lakshadweep andaman and nicobar islands <coughs> he has also been awarded a global fellowship in marine conservation by the duke university and is a fellow of the lead india and international visitors program in the usa He is a recipient of the Vasundhara Green Teachers Award and the Rotary Award for Environmental Conservation. He is also a well-received author. He has to his credit five books and sixty scientific papers in the field of coastal and marine biodiversity in prestigious journals like Nature, Wow, Evolution, Ecological Indicators, <coughs> Journal of Natural History, Zoo Keys, Systematics and Biodiversities. zoo taxa and many many more he is also an accomplished underwater photographer with over 5000 hours of diving experience he is a member of several key committees of the government of india such as a member of the national board of wildlife chairman of the environment appraisal committee on the crz and infrastructure of moefcc member of the monitoring evaluation committee and the list is actually really endless he is a member of coral reef and mangrove committee of the government of gujarat the core group of flamingo city world heritage site and central asian flyway committee of moefcc and he was also the member of the forest advisory committee of the moef so we were wondering if we could start by asking you this question do you know the save the tigers is such a very big movement and uh, of course it's also very important because when you save the tiger you are also saving the habitat and all the species that come along with it but uh, do you think that it one removes the focus from all the other species that also need uh, protection like i read that the black rhino or like uh, dr sina said pygmy hog and so many other kind of species do you think that this kind of a big program removes that uh, you know focus from all the others and secondly it is um, although it is very important i don't deny that but it is outside the urban space why don't we see any big programs that say save urban diversity you know many cities like we don't see crows we don't see pigeons sparrows and so many things like that but i have not seen any program that says save the urban biodiversity so your thoughts on this and some so, more insights from you i think for those who don't know probably nhs was the institution who uh, proposed project tiger way back in 1967 when jc daniel first uh, Uh, wrote a scientific paper on status of tigers i think most of the people forgot <laughs> probably that history uh to certain extent yes i think bulk of our conservation is uh, tiger centric nothing wrong about it because it's a charismatic species firstly second it occupies a very different landscape so you know it's not just about tiger conservation it's conservation of its habitat and watersheds uh, that eventually uh, matters Uh, but to certain ex extent yes i agree that uh, uh, we lost focus on whole range of species uh, be it birds be it invertebrates and marine doesn't exist uh, in our uh, scheme of thinking for conservation except for one or two species today that we talk about uh, 
uh, again they are charismatic species like whale shark and dugong but how many species today uh, you know we have which require conservation intervention nobody speaks at neither at national level nor at uh, state level uh, that's unfortunately is a tragedy for conservation i think the second dimension of what has happened over course of last uh, few years is we have lot of social media activists and that usually uh, drags our attention to some of the very insidious issues and uh, we lose focus and uh, focus and attention on key issues as uh, uh, dr sinha has rightly said that how many people today speak about northeast india uh, except the recent dihang patkai or uh, you know some of these uh, uh, italian hydropower which again got momentum because of social media but by and large these uh, critical areas always uh, lose attention when it comes to uh, social media activism and we have to be a bit careful of uh, the way we deal with this uh, i don't think we have a time to have divided opinion for conservation anymore we don't have that luxury we may have a difference of opinion but we have to reconcile uh, these opinions to make sure that we put up a brave unified front for conservation point of view otherwise we are having our self defeated uh, kind of uh, approach uh, you know that uh, people who believe in uh, rights of people uh, considered today against conservation and vice versa as a hardcore conservationist feel people are impediment in conservation i i don't think these two extreme views are going to be any helpful uh, in your future for conservation point of view also the fact that today's conservation cannot be separated from its social political and eco economic context uh, i think those glorious days are gone long ago and now we our biodiversity or environment is at such a perilous stage and the climate change is adding further uh, the dimensions unknown dimensions uh, to what's going to happen uh, to this species and it's not necessarily every species will go extinct there are some uh, species population will explode because they find this as a wonderful niche the repercussion of the those will st are still uh, quite uh, unknown to that uh, but coming to the point of urban biodiversity i think whatever last remaining pockets we have i think we should try and make effort to save those otherwise there is nothing for people to really know what biodiversity we are talking about and it will only remain either in the documentaries or ppts or uh, you know youtubes and so on and so forth uh, if you take classic case of mumbai uh, which actually provides you a good opportunity to uh, make a very different developmental model because on one side you have got sanjay gandhi national park and tungareshwar uh, sanctuary and uh, the forest of tansa which provides a catchment to almost 40% of water supply to the city so you cannot ignore conservation of those forests because your lifeline comes from there in terms of drinking water the eastern sea front provides the network of small lands which host more than 150000 flamingos and half a million migratory birds and unless we understand the deep science of why these species are present here uh, and how we can then develop uh, plan development to make a win win situation unless that happen we always will be with loggerheads conservationists will be at the loggerheads with the development developers will be at the loggerheads with the conservationists and the ultimately what happens is that the dilution of law is the only way seen forward to make sure you make development without having impediment of conservation and that's a very sad affair today whether it's uh, revised or you know the proposed amendment to the environmental protection act from where the dilutions are coming today we are considered as a impediment in development Uh, that's that's i think the approach we have to fundamentally change through collective wisdom otherwise every single battle will end up in the court of law and what will happen after court give judgment who's going to implement those court orders is the very same mechanism we are uh, fighting for uh, therefore i think we have to put our heads together to prioritize which issue we want to deal with which are of great value addition to that instead of fighting for one tree here and there uh, you know we are losing all our focus attention to very insidious issues and under the carpet and the smoke of this uh, you know social media activism we are actually not seeing what damage has been done to some of the finest areas be it lakshadweep uh, for reefs or andaman nicobar or for arunachal or assam or critical or endangered species areas across country 
i think that's the bottom line that i want to state that we as a conservation community is completely divided uh, unfortunately and that's the sad part of our uh, conservation uh, you know moment um thank you sir i think uh, what we will do is we will go to all the panelists one by one and then come back with specific questions or uh, you know uh, general questions to all the panelists so is that okay with you absolutely whatever you suggest yes sir yeah okay uh, so uh, we come to our next panelist uh, professor pp bakre uh, he is the former professor at uh, rajasthan university he also has a real long list of um, what should i say achievements and uh, positions he was the ex chairman at the state expert appraisal committee at um, the environment impact assessment authority rajasthan he is the ex director of the indira gandhi center for human ecology environment and population studies at the rajasthan university in jaipur he is the ex professor and head of the center for advanced studies zoology department uh, university of rajasthan he is the ex coordinator for the msc microbiology course ex dean school of life sciences at the gyan vihar university jaipur and uh, the ex dean of life sciences of the jecrc university and a member of the committee to select vice chancellor uh, davv uh, indore he is a fulbright fellowship holder of the council for international exchange scholars at uh, usa and uh, he has more than 42 years of teaching experience he is also the member 17 years and a member of the committee drafting the 12th five year plan of rajasthan sir as a member of the wildlife board you are challenged with all problems like uh, you know the poachers illegal cutting of the forest land also i'm sure legal cutting also creates a problem in wildlife but we will leave that aspect out for now but mainly you deal a lot with these kind of problems uh, in the forest area but what about the urban scene sir what are the factors that we should take care of uh, when we talk of conserving urban biodiversity professor bakri i think you are on mute sir sir we can't hear you hello Yes, sir. Now Hello. we can hear you. Yes, yes. Now yeah. we can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, friends. Most of us have the belief that our urban areas are not home of the wildlife, but incidentally, there are large number of species, wildlife species, which coexist with us and also visit our cities once in a while. Like there are monkeys and pigeons, which are a common wildlife species in India. but there are certain which are not visible that much because some of them are nocturnal like jackals and civets often we in fact promote activities to preserve the wildlife near us in some cases however the interaction of the wildlife in unintentional and of course unwanted you know visits of lions leopards tigers and elephants they are a news item and then the reason is that why these wildlife species are attracted to the urban environment is that all the four requirements that is food water shelter and space are available in the urban environment space is required because traditionally they should be able to successfully uh, rear their young ones and also uh, shelter that should protect them all the time but then wild pigeons and all these they are sustaining themselves in the urban environment because of the courtesy of who are able to feed them continuously without domesticating them now uh, the raptors such as hawks owls and kites are highly successful predators in urban environment and help control the population levels of their prey species 
snakes are predators and eat various types of small birds and birds. However, filtration is paid to the services these animal city dwellers. The snake bunkus, common mina, and crows roosting in the park trees are considered as nuisance, but consider the value of services they provide to the city by keeping it clean. Then there are many animals that enter cities and they get killed because of what we call as road kills. There are many songbirds which are now singing in higher pitch to overcome the noise of the cities. Unfortunately, the proliferation of artificial lighting in the cities is threatening the wildlife. Many animals depend on the regular rhythm of day and night to keep themselves regulated by what is called as a circadian rhythm. But some of the nocturnal animals depend on the dark nights to allow them to hunt. Many moths and some insects only come out at night to mate and reproduce. There are many turtles hatchlings which are moving to the light, lighted beaches rather than moving towards the sea and to be guided by the light of the horizon Instead, they move in the exactly opposite direction and get killed. In many areas, high levels of light pollution is confusing these wild animals and disturbing the pattern of their life. They are experiencing a 24-hour day. Hundreds of species of migratory birds, they fly after the sunsets, including most songbirds. But scientists speculate that when they fly near the urban areas, the bright lights short circuit their steering senses. There are many instances where, where they are struck against the windows of the high rising buildings. And as you know, that many bad species are attracted to the insects that congregate around light source. As the world grapples with the coronavirus, researchers have found the presence of a different kind of coronavirus, bad coronavirus, in two bat species from Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Puducherry, and Tamil Nadu, according to study of the ICMR. Now, that brings us to a question as to why we are encouraging plantation of fruiting trees in the urban gardens. Because in a way, we are inviting bats to the urban gardens and along with them, a host of viruses, which might ultimately cause trouble for the human race. So we should be very careful when we are recommending plantation of trees. Then there are certain other aspects like air pollution, which normally people don't appreciate that there are many bird species which are sharing the environment with us. In fact, they are breathing, particularly the pigeons, they are breathing the same air as we breathe. And then because of the higher basic metabolic rate, because they have an accessory respiratory organs, they are inhaling much more air than us. And as a result, there is every possibility that they would suffer from uh, air pollution. So, a particular aspect has been exploited by the scientists, and now they are studying the feathers of these birds. And we have developed a methodology wherein we use the figure of these birds to analyze the air pollution level in different cities. So not only that they are bad for us, but yes, at times they can be useful for monitoring of the air pollution and other types of pollution in the cities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. We'll uh, go to our next panelist now. Uh, Shri Jain Sastrabuddhe ji. Uh, he's the National Organizing Secretary of the Vignan uh, Bharti. He's basically an electronics engineer, but is a think tank of many national committees and he is a great social worker. Uh, sir, uh, like Dr. Sina said, that we need to put in the welfare of the people along with biodiversity conservation. So, kya hum aise jobs nahi create kar sakte that can link biodiversity conservation and welfare together so that, uh, you know, they, we have a larger reach than what we have today? 
yeah namaste to everyone i would like to switch over to hindi because i know many of the viewers uh, they would like to hear something in hindi uh aapne jo ek prashna pucha hai uske main aur baat aap sabhi ke samne rakhna chahunga ki hum jaiva vividhata ki raksha ki baat karte hain lekin ek विज्ञान आंदोलन के कार्यकर्ता इस नाते जो अनुभव आता है वो ऐसा है कि विशेषकर नागरिक क्षेत्र में जो लोग अपना जीवन यापन करते हैं उनके जीवन के साथ जैव विविधता का क्या रिश्ता है इसको उनको समझाने में हम बहुत ही कम पढ़ते हैं और इसके कारण ये सारे लोग जैव विविधता की महत्ता को नहीं समझ पाते और उसके कारण उनका जितना योगदान जैव विविधता की रक्षा में होना चाहिए उतना हमें नहीं मिलता और कई प्रकार की बातें लोग कहते हैं कि अपनी बचपन में तो हम चिड़िया देखते थे तोते देखते थे कबूतर देखते थे आज उनकी संख्या बहुत कम हो गई लेकिन इनका जीवन का इनके जीवन ये जो सारे पशु पक्षी है इनका ये जो जीवन चलता है हम सभी के साथ साथ उसका अपने जीवन से क्या रिश्ता है अपने जीवन को अधिक विकसित करने के लिए उन्नत बनाने के लिए भी उनका कुछ योगदान होता है क्या इस बात को समझाने में कहीं कमी रही है उसके कारण लोग इसका महत्व जानते नहीं उसकी ओर दुर्लक्ष करते हैं अनदेखी करते हैं और उसके कारण पर्यावरण और विशेष रूप से जैव विविधता की क्षति ये लगातार होती हुई हम अनुभव कर रहे हैं तो एक विशेष बात इस पर ध्यान देनी पड़ेगी जैसे दीपक जी ने भी संकेत दिया कि जो पर्यावरण की रक्षा या जैव विविधता की रक्षा करने में लगे हुए जितने समूह हैं उनके अंदर भी आपसी तालमेल की बड़ी आवश्यकता है किस प्रकार से समाज तक पहुंचना किन बातों को लेकर समाज को जागृत करना समाज का प्रबोधन करना इसके ऊपर एक सहमति बनाने की बड़ी आवश्यकता है ऐसे लगता है तो हमें इन बातों का विचार करना चाहिए कि ये सारी महत्वपूर्ण बातें हैं लेकिन लोग उसको समझ नहीं पा रहे जैसे एक सामान्य बात अब सामने आ रही कि अगर जैव विविधता बनी रहे तो संक्रामक रोगों का फैलाव भी जितनी गति से हो रहा है उतना नहीं होगा ये भी एक सामान्य बात है लेकिन लोग उसको समझ नहीं रहे या विज्ञान क्षेत्र के लोग उनको इन बातों को समझाने में असफल हो रहे हैं इस बात की ओर हमें ध्यान देने की बड़ी आवश्यकता है क्योंकि आधुनिक विज्ञान के द्वारा जिस प्रकार की जीवन शैली का निर्माण हुआ है उसमें विविधता के स्थान पर एक समानता मोनोकल्चर लाने का प्रयास बहुत बड़ी मात्रा में हुआ है उसके चलते ये विविधता का महत्व क्या है ये सामान्य लोग अब समझ नहीं पा रहे तो हमें इस बात की ओर ध्यान देना पड़ेगा एक हम सभी विज्ञान के क्षेत्र से जुड़े हुए लोगों के अंदर एक सहमति बनानी चाहिए कि कौन सी बातों को लेकर समाज तक जाना चाहिए और जैव विविधता का अपने जीवन के साथ क्या महत्वपूर्ण रिश्ता है उसको लोगों को समझाने की बड़ी आवश्यकता है और एक और बात मुझे ऐसे अनुभव में आती है कि नगरी क्षेत्र में जो बच्चे है जो आज जिनकी आयु छोटी है उनके साथ भी इसके बारे में एक बहुत बड़ा संवाद निर्माण करने की आवश्यकता है क्योंकि इनके ही हाथ में भविष्य है और भविष्य को करने के लिए बचपन से अगर इनको हम ये सारी बातों के बारे में जानकारी दे पाएंगे तो मुझे लगता है कि बहुत ही अच्छी तरह से हम भविष्य की ओर बढ़ सकते हैं thank you uh, sir uh, we will now come to our uh, last panelist dr r d jakati uh, he is the former director of the Indra indira gandhi national forest uh, academy he has over 37 years of professional experience in the field of forest and uh, wildlife management he superannuated as the director of the indira gandhi national forest academy dehradun in february 2012 and uh, 
he was the chief wildlife warden in the haryana state over for over 9 years he established the vulture conservation center at pinjor and was conferred the honorary conservation fellowship by the zoological society in london he also worked as the director general forest survey of india his professional expertise includes wildlife management participatory governance resource assessment and capacity building sir with so much of hands on experience and dedicating so many years of your life into this aspect would you say that our existing policies for biodiversity conservation are enough are they successfully implemented or are they not enough and we need to add some more focus into this सर आप म्यूट पर हैं नहीं सर वी कैंट हियर यू सर नाउ या नाउ वी कैन या ओके आई विल आंसर योर क्वेश्चन बाय वन ऑफ दिस स्टडीज कंडक्टेड बाय फॉरेस्ट सर्वे ऑफ इंडिया इन वे बैक इन 2004 Uh, on the sustainability of forest management in the country uh various parameters were considered and the conclusion in the nutshell was the sustainability of forest management in india is not in real sense sustainable in real sense out of 100 it got only uh 56 marks so sustainable forest management in india is not really sustainable in true sense now one of the parameters which which failed to even cross 50% marks was the health of the ecosystem now health of the ecosystem uh, is one of the parameters which constitutes uh, composition structure of the forest and the landscape now forest survey of india has been conducting the uh, wall to wall by wall to wall mapping the forest cover of the country what does it say it says only the forest cover one it does not speak of the biodiversity or the condition of the forests now this is now and we get carried out uh, we get carried by the um, uh, uh, india state of forest report produced annually stating that we are okay at that level what is important is not only the cover but the biodiversity per se needs to be assessed in various ecosystems of the country now it's a huge task because conducting this survey means you have to go to different areas or at different times now some of the forests are not accessible you cannot see them through the satellite imagery satellite imagery cannot identify a uh, smaller species animals and smaller bits so regular visit of the forest at different times of the year is very important for carrying out the survey now this has not been possible in the country so far because it needs huge infrastructure it needs huge funding so to answer your question directly that whether i am satisfied with the uh, the way we are proceeding for the biodiversity conservation no uh, we are not really doing many things which need to be done why there are two things very important things see the the will of the government will of the people is reflected in the policies of the government will of the in a democratic country will of the people is de- uh, reflected in the will of the in the policies of the government and what are the priorities of the government health education road network communication um, uh, irrigation agriculture where does conservation of the wildlife and animal comes it is at the ninth or tenth place in the priorities of the government now take the priorities of the individuals or the society or a common man he wants his children to go to iit or 
get good education he wants electricity he wants drinking water he wants all these things you ask anyone he will say no wo baad mein baat karenge first i want my child to go to a good school i want all the good infrastructure my for my family so neither in the in the policies of the government nor in the priorities of the individuals and the social structure forest and conservation come at a higher level and more so this becomes more so important in a poor country like india where the budget is a big constraint and we have to do with whatever little is available now uh, deepak apte is here as the director of the bnhs before he joined as the uh, before he became the director of the bnhs we started our vulture um, uh, conservation project in haryana we know how much um, resource crunch we have been facing for first 6 years it was uk government which funded the uh, funded the project later on with the government of india and now when the government of india funds the project working is done by the uh, ngo bnhs there are conflicts there are conflicting issues and then the conflict resolution in even in such cases is becomes difficult because our own bureaucratic rules are so very rigid they are i mean we are unable to resolve and then more because government has lesser priorities for uh, environment and forest environment per se because of pollution and water it, ef e becomes important because of water and air but when it comes to biodiversity per se oh we are far to be far below what is expected of or what should be am i have i answered your question yes yes sir okay you have thank you yeah so anything more you want to say sir yes i want to say many things in fact urban yeah. for because one of the things one of the topic is urban forestry yes so what has happened is because of the migration of the rural population to the urban urban areas and continuous stay over generations in the urban forest we are lost contact with nature and losing contact with nature is inducing stress on human mind and uh, and on the human behavior now recently about 10 15 years back there is there is a book uh, by richard lu which says uh, um, by the title last child of the woods he says that there are nature deficit disorders because we are losing contact with nature nature deficit disorders especially in the children now this nature what are the symptoms of nature uh, deficit disorder lesser concentration you cannot your time for focus or concentration has reduced children cannot study properly their behavior pattern has changed or is changing gradually now this is the time when we have to take care of all these things now what should be done in fact we have to focus on the children first so that our all future generation will be taken care of if we start implementing something at this stage now to 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 do all these things we need to have in every urban conglomerate we need to have some conservation centers now bnhs is doing a good very good job but their reach is far too less i would request dr apte to take up bnhs activities and other ngos wwf and other uh, other people to take up these activities in uh, in all the towns why not the resident welfare associations of every town should come forward to have a nature park biodiversity park let there be medicinal park in every town where people can go identify trees identify plants see birds they can they can they can associate retired retired people they can associate nature lovers into their own activities all kids should be taken to nature reserves and such places at least once a week once a month 
recommended duration is two 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 hours per month. This mm -hmm. is that is recommended. So these these type of activities should be undertaken. Secondly, I would say that now every society need to be ready needs to be ready to pay for biodiversity conservation. You have by taking the taking out forests and establishing uh, cities what have you done you have lost you have lost nature if you want to create any such infrastructure society has to pay by way of a cess or any such thing i was a part of that national forest policy revision committee meeting and we recommended establishment of a uh, afforestation or biodiversity conservation cess and this is precisely why probably the national forest policy which is being resolved has been shelved because nobody wants any cess to be uh, given by society if you are if you have used in the past natural resources pay for it now why not why not that's my question so and this is the role the ngos have to pay because uh, ngos act between the government and the society they have a better contact with the better contact with the people and they can, they can also talk to the government so such activities need to be undertaken on a larger scale B bigger role for ngos more funding more better priority for uh, environment and biodiversity conservation by the government that can only happen only if people talk of it people want it if it is a very low priority for them government will not listen unless government itself is proactive uh, any time but uh, in a in a country like ours where the budget has been a major constraint for even the basic minimum uh, facilities difficult to come in near future thank you thank you very much sir we would really like to use your take your expertise further now um, actually our uh, program schedule says 5 o'clock but it's really rare that we get such a you know, all people on the same platform so if director neeri permits and if all of you are agreeable can we take this a little more further the discussion and we would like to have a discussion between the panelists yes i don't think director neeri has to give permission i think uh, <laughs> if panelists are agreeable then we can go ahead in fact i had few questions uh, myself to ask kuch kuch to guftagu honi chahiye tabhi kuch baat niklegi so can we continue then we will start directly with uh, dr rakesh kumar's questions मेरा एक प्रश्न था जकाती जी से और दीपक आपटी जी से जो जयंत जी से लिंक करता है कि सरकार भी हम बनाते हैं सरकार भी हम ही चलाते हैं पॉलिसी एक्चुअली कम्स फ्रॉम द पीपल हु वी आर राइट सो व्हाई इज दैट गवर्नमेंट इज लुकिंग लाइक अ डिफरेंट एंटिटी और हम लोग अलग दिखते हैं मे बी हमें सही तरीके से क्वेश्चन पूछना या पूछ करना नहीं आ रहा है कैन दैट बी ए सिचुएशन कैन दैट बी योर इशू May I may I, may I comment on it? Yeah, please. Uh, it is on the both sides. One is it's a failure of bureaucracy to convince the politicians, and politicians, please remember, uh, in a democratic setup, have to be what we call as a drasta. They have to be visionaries. If they are visionaries, because they are supposed to lead the country. they are not supposed to go only by the diktat of the people only but the, being visionary they are supposed to lead the country by showing proper path and therefore to 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 show the proper path it is the bureaucracy which has to educate if i mean uh, please uh, excuse me for using that particular word educate the politicians uh, so in fact it is both ways there is there there is wanting at the level of the bureaucracy to convince the politicians and the politicians themselves are not really 
very much, very much convinced or their priorities or as people say uh, it doesn't it doesn't get votes environment and for yes. biodiversity conservation does not gets them votes water irrigation health sir ek bahut 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 dena hai kya can i just interrupt you here there there was a famous saying by justice krishna ayer jab unhone kaha tha ki bureaucracy is worried about immediate and concrete where all these environmental issues are appearing to be remote and abstract so jaise पेड़ कटते हैं उसकी वजह से फ्लड होता है या पेड़ कटते हैं बायोडाइवर्सिटी लॉस होती है इट इज अ प्रोसेस ऑफ टेन इयर्स फिफ्टीन इयर्स ट्वेंटी इयर्स वेर एज ब्यूरोक्रेसी इज वरिड अबाउट थ्री इयर्स एंड फाइव इयर्स तो आई थिंक दैट सम काइंड ऑफ मेकेनिज्म हैज़ टू बी वर्कड आउट ब्यूरोक्रेसी इज ऑल्सो अगेन पार्ट ऑफ आर ओन सिस्टम तो मैं चाहूंगा कि आप तेजी और आई थिंक इवन डॉक्टर सिन्हा कैन मेक सम कमेंट ऑन दिस well it's not as easy as it uh, uh, sounds because uh, everybody has uh, you know their own perceptions and everybody has their own uh, understanding of a subject and unless we know what we really want to do at the end of the day uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of suggestions for example we sent to government and there are probably only 5 6 people sitting at the government desk trying to analyze make sense of the suggestion comes in that's not a win win situation i think there are different models we need to explore i don't think there is one single answer for all the question but the larger point rakesh ji is that <clears throat> uh, we are talking about the people who are getting affected where they have time today to even think of environment their day starts at 6 o'clock in the morning half the time goes for them commuting from their home to office then 8 to 10 hours of duty coming back home where is the time and energy left for the urban population for themselves forget about environment and i think this covid has provided us a wonderful opportunity for us to relook at the way we are living urban life today we realize that we can live without office for 65 days without much of impact uh, in terms of our operation Uh, so why we cannot look at a model where people will get space uh, eventually this is all for the health of the people and if people are not healthy then what kind of environment and policy we are talking about but this has to work at multiple levels for sure and uh, the way there is a education required for bureaucracy and politician i think there is a education required for scientists also in terms of understanding nuances of policies uh so it's not just one way process i think it's a two way process and i uh, agree agree with jakati ji i mean jakati ji we have great respect is the one who really gave us a vision for vulture uh way back when nobody was talking about vulture and i think that vision is required at some point of time at every single level it's not just about one species but in the broader policy context how we want our country to progress further uh, as a win win situation for both environment <laughs> Uh, rakesh sir sonamni ji says i disagree with what you said it's a failure of voters to elect honest representatives okay so uh, i would like to hear from uh, professor sinha uh, what he has to say on this uh, uh, yes i think I, i think i completely agree with what jagati ji said and what deepak ji said i'll just very briefly highlight two quick points one i think is that when you are taking a decision for a nation I think there are so many issues that come up. There's so much of prioritization that we need to do uh, that I think for many of us who think in a much more focused way about certain issues, which are close to our heart or close to our profession, it becomes slightly difficult for us to even appreciate the levels of complexity that comes in. So, and as I think uh, Deepak ji very rightfully pointed out. that it often becomes a question of development versus conservation right and it need not be so however having said that if you say that a particular species needs a very large protected area for its successful reproduction can we as a nation really afford to give that area to the species given that there are other demands so i think i'm giving an extreme example but some of these 
might lie in these kind of prioritization that we have to consider. And we, you win some and you lose some. And I think there needs to be much more dialogue about it. The second point, quick point I want to make is that for a very large majority of the people, I think, again, Deepak Ji pointed out about the urban citizen, but for a very large proportion of our people who actually live with biodiversity, who live in the forests, who live, whose livelihoods depend on them, I sometimes wonder how much of a voice they have. And I think to a certain extent, this may be because decisions are taken again, as Jakati Ji pointed out, or as Deepak Ji pointed out, by a few people sitting on top. Are we listening to everyone? Do we have it within us to even consider the plight of a small population who may think about a certain issue with regard to biodiversity very differently. And, you know, we have some wonderful examples of, let's say, the Niamgiri Hills, where economically, socially, we perhaps think it would have been good to do the bauxite mining. But when a community says that our gods live on these hills and we can do without that money, but let the Niamgiri Hills stay, who takes the decision? Who takes finally the decision? Can economic models ever bring in the idea of cultural identity, of satisfaction, of happiness, of the gods within this? Now, I know we all, each of us on this panel will have very different takes on this, but I just wanted to highlight some of the issues that I think we need to think about a little more deeply. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I have uh, one question from the audience, which I noted. Yeah. And one question myself I have, so if I can ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah the audience question which is coming over here is what uh, Dr. Sina has touched upon. And probably Jayanji bhi ispek tipani karna chahenge. Ki jo tribal area hai hamara, us tribal area mein we are not losing some of the biodiversity. So this biodiversity which we are losing is because the language which we are losing, that we are having urbanization pressure. So, ye, uh, how much pressure, urbanization pressure can be really given on the tribals? Uh, what uh, Dr. Jinnah has also touched upon, that particular thing which is being uh, banished, a particular class of a monkey, deep forest monkey, which was coming from that particular uh, tribal. So, both of them or either of them can comment on this. And my one question to Professor Bakre. Uh, Professor Bakre, you have been mentioning before about uh, effect of light in urban areas on the surrounding wildlife. Any take on that, any comments on that? Hello. As I said, some of the uh, animals which are entering into the urban area, as well as those which are living in the urban area, they have a circadian rhythm. And that is disturbed by the presence of light because for them it is a 24 hour day. So that disturbs their entire lifestyle, you can say life cycle, everything. And as I said, some of them are, uh, as migratory birds, I told you, that's when they are moving from one place to another as a part of the migration, some of them they strike against the light because they are attracted to the light. You are aware of the uh, famous uh, Jatinga sanctuary where people are killing birds by attracting them to the light. So this is a phenomena that they are attracted to the light. At times, they try to reach the source of light. And in between a window fan or anything, they strike at it. And that is how it is affecting the wild birds particularly. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Apte, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, we have, you know, two, uh, what should I say, ways in which this biodiversity conservation work is going on. Uh, one is a group who does the basic uh, kind of studies, which take a little longer time, you know, to understand the system. And, uh, you know, when you, when I say understand the system, that itself becomes such a complex amount of work. Uh, that it's really difficult to define timelines. And uh, one is the group that is actually on the field and uh, working and doing something for the problem at hand. But uh, both these groups, you know, I have not seen anyone interacting with each other or being supportive of each other, which is actually very much needed. 
so what do you say to that is is there a way we can put both <laughs> groups you know in in uh, synchrony with each other i think sometimes scientist as a scientist we also get insecure in terms of if i share my data somebody else will use it i think that insecurity i think we do not really follow uh, the scientific ethics to the core if we are very sure of that we are going to follow scientific ethics to the core i think this mistrust will disappear and that is one of the fundamental gap between why i i am reluctant to share information x to y and y is uh, reluctant to share information with me i think that's a fundamental change we need to bring in within our own uh, scientific community uh, in terms of the ethics that we follow uh, i think the larger context is that where, i mean i also ke- come from a grassroots uh, worker in the beginning 30 years ago and i spent most of my time in the coastal areas working with communities and it does carry uh, you know uh, some degree of disconnect between uh, uh, various levels because at grassroots level and i can tell this ex- uh, plenty of examples when we know that artisanal fishers today are the biggest victim of our fishing policy in this country and having work with that community so closely staying with them you have a very deep sense of respect and understanding for the community which learn to live a most harmonious way with the nature now when you go back as a decision maker and then you need to support the large industrial fishing fleets which actually you know diminish resource for the artisanal fisher now that's the dichotomy for as you climb up the ladder and when you have to take decision of a dis- different uh, uh, you know nature and different character and that is where your ability as a leader will be tested to how we can strike balance between uh, giving rights to the right people and then uh, looking at uh, the developmental model that uh, you know government of india or for that matter any government want to pursue it cannot be divorced from each other that that's exactly what i'm trying to tell you that we as a conservationists also need to understand uh, the developmental need for the country in in totality and that is a fora which is required which is currently missing Uh, we suppose niti ayog is supposed to have that facilitating mechanism which will create that dialogue between various groups because most of the time we end up opposing everything and i can give a classic example look at the power sector where we have uh, this fragmented approach one uh, certain group of people say there is no coal is bad we should not have any coal power some people say we don't have uh, we don't want nuclear because that is more dangerous than coal then the third group will say no no we don't want hydro because it drowns large catchments of good forest areas now we also have problems with our solar and wind because they are threatening some of the most endangered species because we don't take account into science and talk collectively we oppose every single source of uh, energy now from where 1.2 billion people will get energy uh, therefore i think we also need to that's why i'm saying all groups need to put heads together to understand what our needs are which are no go areas that certain areas we are no compromise areas and i think that fundamental piece of jigsaw is completely missing in today's whatever advocacy we do i think we are completely fragmented and at grassroots level i face this dilemma uh, when i sit in this committees and uh, of crz and i have to take decisions uh, where i know many a times that this is not in a best interest of uh, artisanal and traditional uh, communities because their lives are already perilous and we are making it far more perilous and this is just one example i'm sure dr sena will give plenty of example of forest dwelling communities ashish kotari keeps on talking about uh, you know these people for many many years i think we we need to be a different society that's all i'm saying we are not what we should we are we should not be yeah thank you sir dr sena would you like to add something yeah no i don't think i i think uh, i think everybody has uh, made their point and i i completely agree with it i will just make one small point and uh, which is the basic the philosophical basis of my work uh, especially in the in, in current work uh, where we've been looking at urban ecology and i think uh, to put it in one line it would be to think like the other right and we know we've done this in anthropological research where we have 
try to think and uh, Deepak ji just spoke very eloquently about the artisanal fishers and what their priorities are and how they would like to take forward their lives. But I think, what about the other species, right? And so our work in urban ecology, and I will reflect again, and I will continue where, with, where Dr. Bakre was talking about, is do we consider the rights of the non-human or the other than human? I don't think we should say non-human because a non-human would mean that the human is the standard and everything else measures up to them. So I will say other than human. Do we think about how they think? Do we think about what knowledge they have? So when we design a city, when we do urban planning, do we need to consider the other denizens of the city, uh, which again, Dr. Bhakti was talking about, how do we factor their knowledge in? How do we look at their space? How do we look at their perspectives of the city? And this I think is true across natural habitats as well we always think of ourselves as being superior and that may come very naturally to us evolutionally but i think it's perhaps time to step back and really try and see how the others think and whether we can in a way again like deepak ji was saying about various human communities i would like to expand that scope to bring in non-human communities or other than human communities to try and see how the world can be shaped not only by what we want but also to a certain extent, and of course, there'll be compromised by what they want and what would be good for them as well. I just wanted to say that. Julia, yeah, I also yeah. have a question, Dr. Kapli, a quick one. Yes, uh, sir. We are, we are talking about biodiversity preservation for integrating society. And here we are talking about all adult minds. But are we doing enough to influence the young minds at the school time, at early education level, levels? that these are important factors. And are we doing that? Uh, first of all, should we be doing that? And are we doing enough at that level? That's really true. I think Dr. Jakarti and Dr. Sina both are wanting to say something. Dr. Sina. Uh, thank you very much. No, I just wanted to say that, uh, Narish ji, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's extremely important. And I do know that there have been other studies which have seen that even when we are spreading the message of conservation or biodiversity, one of the most important ways is to really talk to children, not only because they are the future, but also we find that when you talk to children, they talk to their parents and their change comes in because the parents are forced to listen to how the children look at certain things, right? Now, here, I just wanted to very briefly say that in NIAS, uh, we have a group led by Dr. Vivi Binoy, who has actually been working with school and college students to make them what he calls citizen scientists. So basically, he has set up this network across Kerala, Rajasthan, Mizoram, uh, uh, Chhattisgarh, where he's involved school and college teachers, made them resource centers, and he's been addressing children from two perspectives. One, to make them think, because they can still afford to, uh, because they are not right now professionals, their careers don't, they are not thinking of careers, to make them think about their relationship with nature so that in the future they might be able to take decisions about their own lives and those of others that will take nature into account. But the second and the more important thing is to make them active stakeholders. What he does is he gives them simple equipment, makes them design simple equipment to collect data, maybe on rainfall, on biodiversity, uh, on the soil conditions, and that data comes back and they become if not technically authors but they have a role to play in the building up of knowledge so they feel that through their observations their participation in natural activities they are actually contributing to the nation's knowledge to our knowledge and i think they feel start feeling important that they have something to contribute and i couldn't agree with you more again that we must think of ways in which they can participate and be a part of this entire exercise of building up knowledge and from their cons conservation and other activities that they can contribute to. Um, thank you, sir. Dr. Chakati, you also wanted to say something on this. Sir, you are on mute. We can't hear you. You have to unmute, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, we were talking of the we were talking about the uh, sensitization of the younger generation about the uh, about nature and conservation issues. 
various foreign departments i know of certainly i know of gujarat i know of haryana where i work and many other states even uttarakhand we have been con conducting uh, nature education camps for school children two days one days nature education camps where the children are brought made them to stay in the tents in the forest nearby forest area take them for trek inside the forest explain uh, various aspects of forestry nature birds plants and so on so forth and the children go very happy children children were very happy with all this type of knowledge now i was referring to my earlier statement about the nature deficit disorder now to overcome the nature deficit disorders these things are very necessary although nature education camps became came up much earlier than the nature deficit deficit con concept was introduced so in fact but what we are doing at the moment is too less what needs to be done that every school should be involved every school should be involved at least a once a month who does it how do they do it that's a different thing but that is a necessity as of today and should be done so what we are doing presently is not enough yes yes thank you sir i uh, had actually one more question for you sir uh, when we talk of urban biodiversity there is a concept that uh, you can pool you know the little spaces that are there in a city and make a, like a continuous uh, system and create your bio biodiversity niches is that actually really possible and feasible to do it you know they say from one garden to the other don't just randomly plant but uh, you know make these kind of niches so uh, your biodiversity niches can be created in into the city and they are linked with each other is that really feasible well linking may not be possible linking per se may not be possible but creating small spaces is possible gardens well we we'll lay more emphasis on beautification of the gardens beautification should be done by the local indigenous species than by exotic species because if you bring in the local or indigenous species you attract many birds you attract the flow uh, local fauna also if you plant only the exotics royal by well, like the royal palm no, no bird will sit on that tree it looks beautiful all right but so that's it so we have to create small nature parks where each and plant each and every tree and plant is uh, named its utility is described pathways are created so that children and people can walk around and get the knowledge about flora and fauna uh, that what needs to be done in fact but then linking all these things uh, if possible should be done but generally may not be possible because you have roads and buildings and other urban infrastructure coming in between it you may do it by you may do it only for birds all right for example some birds um, in, in the nearby water body in nagpur comes to my place which is 4 kilometers from the water body i see kingfisher in my house so for birds it is all right but for other animals it may not be really possible uh, to the extent possible we should do it otherwise at least we should develop some uh, nature parks in every town not only one but in every part of the town yeah thank you sir dr deepak uh, wanted to say something no i just want to add bit on education part of it as you know bnhs uh, already run three education center one in mumbai one in from rajbhavan of nagpur and one in delhi in asolabatti and collectively we cater to about 100000 kids annually on environmental education uh, of course every city has a space and opportunity to do that and it must be done because that's where our actual future uh, uh, you know hope rests uh, of creating this constituency of young conservation uh, leaders uh, which are between 5 years or 3 years to uh, you know 16 17 years and a larger point as jakati ji has said uh, in fact we tried this into maharashtra state when i was member of the state wildlife board and when we used to consider uh, this large housing complexes in mumbai and that is a time when we said instead of just beautification 
why don't you use those open mandatory spaces to develop butterfly gardens or plant trees which are which will attract birds and if such policy reforms can be taken in the spirit of why want to do i think you will see lot more large housing colonies with lovely you know open areas uh, to have a conservation model in fact we are recently working with loda group of uh, you know companies they have a large township uh, near mumbai and they have they are constructing dedicated education center to cater to about 50000 kids annually into the catchment of uh, where their uh, setup is going to be and i think those are the fundamental changes uh, there is a scope and we must work with this sector to make sure that we create those spaces it's doable absolutely uh thank you sir uh i think if uh, uh, nobody else has a comment to make can we close this session yeah and uh, so thank you again all of you uh, we really had a really wonderful panel discussion and we are really enriched by your expertise uh, we are really grateful that you all spared your time and came and made this world environment day uh, celebrations of ours a great success we really have a lot to learn from all of you and we hope that we will get more chance Uh, in future to interact with you and to actually bring your ideas into ground level work at uh, needy and also probably with uh, vibha if they they join us uh, and so now i will hand over the mic to uh, shri naresh chapale uh, he would uh, conclude this session yeah it's uh, naresh chapekar Sorry, uh, I would that's okay. Uh, I would start with the Sanskrit subhashita. Saurakshita dushito nasya loka manav jivanam nakopi kasya chit nasham kuriya darthas te siddaye. अर्थात् संसार प्रदूषित न हो मानव जीवन सुरक्षित रहे धन की सिद्धि के लिए कोई भी किसी का खास करके प्रकृति का नुकसान ना करे. ye i hope that we follow this and uh, we make uh, our environment or paryavaran much better place uh, before i uh, get into a uh, word of thank uh, i would like to mention something here today's event uh, was actually in two parts um, one part of it is this panel discussion where we are heard to all the eminent speakers the other part was online competitions that was for me and my environment a lockdown experience entries from five different categories were invited uh, like students from 5th to 8th standard from 9th to 12th standard undo undergraduate and post graduates teaching staff and the fifth category was the ones who do not fall in any of these four categories and we had asked for uh, you know different kind of uh, by making posters pictures essay or a video and uh, th this was uh, pan india and it was not only pan india we had participants from kuwait uae bahrain saudi arabia and qatar also where vidyan bharti has lot of work so uh, i'm glad to share with you that uh, actually the last date of it is like tonight so tonight uh, till tonight uh, midnight hopefully will accept the entries and uh, i'm glad to share with you all that so far uh, the registrations for this uh, competition is close to 10000 and the entries we have received so far are almost nearing 8000 so 8000 entries have come so far and it's it's going to be a tough task for now for us now to you know evaluate all of it and all of the, the great work but uh, this is something really great that has happened and tremendous response and this response couldn't have come uh, and i think for that now we need to thank niri CSIR Niri for such a great effort that they have put in their team really put together all this technological needs like zoom platform streaming on to facebook streaming on to youtube and they have done a wonderful job so uh, i would like to thank niri i would like to thank niri for uh, tying up with us vidyan bharti and uh, giving us an opportunity to be part of uh, such a great event uh we really uh, think uh, this is something this has uh, you know shown a great success 
and we hope that in future we'll be able to do rakesh ji uh, hopefully we can continue to do this uh, kind of an event because we have gotten a good response and i think we have pulled it out uh, really well so thank you neeri uh, thank you vibha team also vidyan bharti team has uh, coordinated very well on this efforts um, i would like to thank the panelist uh, before that i will say uh, that uh, thank you very much dr rakesh kumar director neeri who put all of this together uh, uh, our keynote speaker professor uh, sina from nis bangalore Uh, sir you really enlightened us by uh, you know talking about northeast area which is in almost all aspects of life we kind of tend to ignore which is not right thing but uh, northeast gets ignored it is uh, getting better now and you added a feather to it by you know uh, talking about the biodiversity of northeast so thank you very much we are also grateful to dr deepak apte director bhns professor bakre uh, former um, uh, professor of uh, rajasthan university uh, shri jain uh, sastrabuddha our national secretary uh, dr zakati an if ifs officer um, i thank you all um, apart from this i would like to thank the moderator uh, dr kaple and rajesh biniwale uh, from niri uh, the team worked great and uh, we could pull it off because of everybody's help so thank you very much thank you to the all the audience who are listening to us on facebook and youtube channels thank you so thank you everybody and i hope we will interact again thank you very much thanks thanks a lot thanks everybody thank you very much sir thank you it was wonderful to be with all of you thank you very much again it was amazing to have got all of you at one time that was that was very special jain ji special thanks we wanted to hear you more uh, maybe next time we will have a separate session with you yes. all of you in fact all of you are worth uh, a one day event uh, with, with us we, sure. we we promise we'll do that thank you we look forward to that thank you very much thank again. you thank you thank you bye 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 bye